Welcome to Conversations That Matter. Mike, today we're having another of our conversations with an eminent scientist from Princeton University. Let's talk a little bit about who our guest is today. Uh, today we'll hear from Freeman Dyson. He's a 91-year-old mathematical physicist, one of the most renowned scientists in the United States, been around for six decades. He, an extraordinary mind. Ex I, uh, it, talking to one of our previous guests who went, <laughs> you're talking to who? Like, to say that he has a big brain would be an understatement. That's right, and this is someone who actually works in the same building uh, at Princeton that Einstein worked in. And interestingly enough, not only works in that building, but he was actually there when Einstein was there. I know, it's extraordinary. You go into the building, there's this bust of Albert Einstein, and the address is one Einstein drive, and it dawns on you that this is a place where some rather extraordinary thinking happens. Extraordinary, and in his own words, subversive science. Contrarian. Contrarian, that. yeah. Freeman Dyson believes we ought to be using science as a way to upend the apple cart and particularly teach young people that science can be an act of rebellion, uh, positive rebellion, you know, to push against now, poverty. Now, there's many and, people who are on, on, on the climate uh, change side of the equation who are advocating that we're in trouble, and they say that science is support, supports that. They're not going to be so happy with the conversation with Freeman Dyson. Well, Freeman Dyson is probably someone that comes out on more of the neutral side uh, in terms of climate change. He obviously uh, acknowledges that there is a rising carbon in the, in the environment. And that the temperature has gone up. The temperature has gone up. But I think his approach is to say we, we don't know enough. And, you know, we need to focus on things in the world that we know enough about to change. It, it, you're right, not knowing enough. He says, well, I know the guy who designed the first computer model that all other models are based on. Like, he knows the guy, and he knows that the model can't mirror what is in climate. And, and this is his point. And so he says, yes, we've had this effect, but it's the predictive model that is difficult for him to embrace. <laughs> so as you look forward, I, I think that one of the challenges for all of us, no matter where we are in life right now, to, to look 100 years out, we, don't, we won't be there to see what the result was. Exactly. And so how do we know? Well, you, some things you can be pretty sure of. And, and uh, the fact is that carbon dioxide will increase we will continue to burn oil and coal and probably it does us good. The earth will get greener as a result. What do you say to people who uh, want to have the same level of optimism that you do about the future but they're afraid to, uh, to go against uh, the common uh, or the current um, embracing of uh, global warming and potential catastrophe. How do you, how do you give to to viewers and, and the future this sense of uh, of optimism about our our world that you well, have? I mm -hmm. think that if you talk to Chinese and Indians and people from Asia generally, they don't feel uh, pessimistic at all. I mean, generally speaking, those countries in particular, things have improved so much in the last fifty years that they see continued improvement. So that this, uh, this sort of mood of doom and gloom is, I would say, only in, in, in particularly in the academic com communities and uh, particularly in the Western societies. So, and I, it's, it, so I, I don't think it's at all universal. It happens that the media have gone along with it, but uh, I think that the, the general public has a lot more common sense. I, I noticed uh, that you also have Cool It on the table here uh, yes. <laughs> in anticipation of our conversation. Yes. Why did you bring out this book? Well, it, I think it's the best general summary I've seen in, in, in a way. I mean, he's an economist, not a scientist, but uh, I think he's very sound. Mm -hmm. And it certainly makes a pretty good case on, on economic grounds. Now, he's been attacked, of course, as well. Oh, of course. And, and Dr. Willie Soon uh, just recently has been uh, vilified. Yes. No, I think the, the fact is that uh, 
you ought to enjoy being in the minority, and, and that's, that's the way I feel. I, but of course, I'm lucky because I'm retired. I don't have to fear of losing, losing my job. And, and <laughs> is any science incontrovertible? Because you get people, there is a fellow in Vancouver who is a well-respected lover of nature, uh, and he has been explaining nature to Canadians for decades now who is at the point where he says, if you don't believe in man-made climate change, then you should go to jail. I mean, literally speaking, it's true. I mean, man-made climate change certainly is, is, is real. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt it's real. And just a question is how much and how, whether it's good or bad. And those are quite separate questions. And from